Uh, just uh, first of all, as a little bit of an introduction, my name's Jim Hayward. Um, I've worked for uh, about 25 years, really, on, on things like atmospheric aerosols and uh, how they impact climate. Um, uh, some of this will, will touch um, ground that uh, Sir, Dave, Sir David has already covered, um, but most of it I think you'll find quite interesting and informative, so do listen. Okay. So, um, so David has talked about where we are in terms of uh, climate and climate change. And I think the, the, the main thing that people don't quite realise, uh, the general public, when we're talking about where we'll be um, by sort of 2090, the end, the end of the century, um, this is a, for a, a global mean temperature rise of around about four and a half degrees. Now, what you'll see when you actually look at that is that, is not, that doesn't look very global, does it? There's an awful lot of uh, regional um, vari variability. Um, for example, the north, northern ice cap has gone up by 20 degrees. You can imagine what's going to happen to the, uh, the sea ice uh, and obviously Greenland as well. New York, I, I think I gave this to Americans, so New York I picked on has gone up by 8 degrees. But the Amazon has gone up by 8 degrees as well. We don't know whether the Amazon can survive that. That's, uh, that's really rather extreme. Another one that maybe think of it this way for those of you who think, okay, well, you know, if you look at the UK, you go, hey, we're all right. Um, we have, we're sort of sat there in the yellow. Think about it this way. Um, uh, the Mediterranean, if, when, when I have a look at my climate model, the climate, the, the climate in the climate model for the Mediterranean region in terms of the temperature and the soil moisture, which is really you know, what, what you need in terms of uh, growing stuff, has become like the Sahara Desert. Now that gives you some idea. Do you think that people are going to stick around in the Mediterranean or are they going to migrate? So you've got to bear in mind that, this isn't, that people are not static. They will move. And so any, of the, any sort of uh, the migration of populations, this really sort of gives you some idea of how severe things are. So it's an interesting plot, I think. Uh, this, is, um, this is something that, um, why I th this again goes down to why I think we will have to consider some of these technologies. Um, this is a, a complicated plot, but essentially what it shows uh, is the temperature increase as a function of the total amount of carbon dioxide that's been emitted and basically, you can see that all of, the, the, all of these climate uh, models and the observations actually go up more or less a linear line along here. So as you uh, add more carbon, as we use up more carbon, um, the temperature obviously goes up. And it's, it just really depends on how quickly you go up this, this line that's almost a sort of uh, linear relation. The thing is that for, for any temperature target, you can read off the allowed carbon budget. So for one and a half degrees, here we are. Um, you've got basically, to date we've emitted approximately 590 uh, gigatons of carbon, and the current rate is about 10 uh, gigatons of carbon per year. For one and a half degrees, that's approximately 600 uh, gigatons of carbon. So that means to avoid exceeding one and a half degrees, we have to be net neutral by next year. All right? Think of that from, a, from an engineering perspective. You're all engineers. How are we going to do that? The lights are on here. We've got power. We're all doing things. So think about that. That just shows how hard it is. And this is something I, I just thought, thought sort of drives home that, almost, that impossibility, I would say, of, of hitting one and a half degrees. What, this is uh, from uh, Dave McKay, um, who was um, uh, the deck chief scientist for, for a while. Uh, and these show uh, options for 42 kilowatt hours per person per day per technology. And, and we've got things up here like biofuel, these are the green things. Wind energy, this is approximately uh, the, the approximate area that you'd need. Solar energy in deserts, nuclear, one per million people, um, etc. And um, you can see that this is, this is the thing. For, for each of those technologies, that is 42 kilowatt hours per person per day. But America's currently using 250. 
So you need all of those, and you need those by next year, okay, to be net neutral. Going to happen? I can show a similarly gloomy picture, unfortunately, for the UK. I, I, I know I'm not, I'm not going to have time to go into this, but, you know, the, 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 uh, in order to hit a one and a half degree target, we have to be uh, net neutral by next year. We've got to do this in terms of biofuel. We've got to do this in terms of uh, solar energy coming from deserts, fire pipelines, etc. wind energy. It's hard. So this is why, why climate repair, um, I've been working a little bit on, on this for, for uh, about the last decade. Climate repair has come into, um, has really sort of started to be talked about a little bit more seriously. Now, uh, this, is a, this is something from New Scientist a decade ago now, where you're talking about uh, technologies like space mirrors to reflect sunlight back out to space. You're talking about things like uh, emitting aerosols into the stratosphere, again, to reflect sunlight back out to space. You're talking about these fancy flattener rotor ships that inject uh, sea salt and hopefully uh, brighten uh, clouds and increase the albedo of the planet. There are some keys on this, which is basically the cooling factor, the readiness and the cost. Um, they fall into two categories, one of which is carbon dioxide removal. Um, which might be things like bioenergy and carbon capture and storage. The other is solar radiation management. And solar radiation management is essentially making the planet brighter, reflecting sunlight back out to space and cooling the planet. Sounds like science fiction, doesn't it? Um, now I'm going to go to uh, Fourier. I'm going to use Fourier's model uh, uh, that David referred to because it's very easy to understand. Um, I'm not going to put an atmosphere in here, but... Essentially, uh, the amount of sunlight absor absorbed by the planet uh, depends on something called the, the, the planetary albedo. So the planetary albedo is just the amount of reflected radiation over the, the amount of total radiation. And it's the balance between the sunlight absorbed and the emitted thermal radiation. For equilibrium, those, those need to be in balance. And therefore, you end up with this. Uh, this, is, this is an equation. I, the, I thought maybe some of you might be interested in a little bit of maths. That's why I'm in a maths department. So um, basically the temperature is, is uh, the fourth root of uh, this, these terms here where uh, S naught is the solar constant, alpha P is the planetary albedo, and epsilon is the emissivity. So the challenge is how you can cool the planet. Now you can do that either by... Uh, reducing S naught or increasing the planetary albedo or, um, or increasing the emissivity. The emissivity is really um, what, you, what you're uh, doing when, you, when you're changing greenhouse gases. But the planetary albedo has been one of the th is one of the things that perhaps you could adjust. Um, this is a, the Royal Society report from 2009, and it, it really shows a, um, a four-dimensional... Uh, uh, plot of effectiveness, affordability, and there's also safety. Uh, red is, is classed as being safe and timeliness. Large is classed as being quick. So let me see whether I can do this. This is low effectiveness, low affordability. Can you see that red flashing light there? Conversely, this is high effectiveness, high affordability, safe and timely. So uh, really, the, the two that, that sort of... Um, I've been looking at in some detail are stratospheric aerosols, because it's on the top right hand, and also cloud albedo. These are both things that um, can be addressed with by uh, emission of particles into the atmosphere uh, or aerosols. This is a, the same climate model that, that basically does our, our simulations of, of uh, climate um, at the Hadley Center model. And I've got a couple of different simulations here. You've got an RCP 8.5, which is essentially a, 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 hey, we don't really care too much. We don't believe that, that uh, these things are a problem. Or a RCP 4.5, which actually includes a little bit of uh, carbon dioxide removal uh, through, um, well, active carbon dioxide removal. But you can see the temperatures are going up. And bear in mind, this, this one up, up here is sort of where, where you're going to get those increases uh, in, uh, say, the Arctic of around about 20 degrees, according to our climate model. 
If you run this forward, now we're, this is a simulation with uh, geoengineering, and we're putting a certain amount of aerosol into the stratosphere in this case. So you're injecting sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere to make the planet more reflective uh, and cool the planet. Um, the climate model simulations, we've repeated those with things like an objective of hitting one and a half degrees. Um, so these are, are the high end scenarios going down to our most optimistic scenario, which is called RCP 2.6, representative concentration pathway 2.6. And for all of these, we, 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 our objective in the modeling framework is to, is to basically get to zero, get to uh, one and a half degrees. You can see that uh, this is the uh, emission rate of sulfur dioxide, and by, if, you, if you're going to offset uh, eight and a half degrees, you have to be injecting 30, uh, sorry, RCP 8.5, then you're going to have to be emitting 30 terograms per year, 30 megatons of sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere. Obviously, if, if we can, um, if we can reduce the amount of carbon that we're, that we're emitting, you can do this with, with less. This is what the, the, the climates look like under these uh, various different scenarios. So this is the high emission scenario. This is what the, uh, the mean temperature looks like. It looks very similar to what you've seen before on that first rather alarming plot I've shown. This is what happens if you geoengineer. And you can see there is a little bit of residual still warming it in the, in the, the northern uh, extremes but that is a heck of a lot better than this and that's the same through all of these uh, uh, simulations that are with a uh, Hadley Center model. So this is if you like the difference between these this is the the amount of cooling that the geoengineering is able to uh, able to apply. Um, so David talked about extremes, and I, I agree extremes are, are one of the things that we have to look at in, in a lot more detail. And we, we are looking at these now with our climate models in, in more detail than, than ever before. These are the various different scenarios, and, and basically our zero line here is, what is, is where we are currently. Um, and, and under RCP, say take 8.5, we are able to uh, remove, reduce the temperature from here to here, soil moisture from here to here, uh, northern sea ice from here to here, i.e. we are getting very much closer to where we are now in practically all these extremes. We're looking at mean sea level here. This is European heat waves, uh, which the, Sir David talked about. And this is Katrina-sized hurricanes. So really, damaging climate extremes are they reduced by geoengineering? And the answer is very much so, yes. Um, potential problems associated with climate repair. I would be remiss if I didn't put these up. And this is a paper that, that appeared quite a long time ago. And really, you can see uh, the benefits are essentially cool the planet. Um, and the, there's six listed here. But there's this large set of risks, some of which are physical climate risks, for example, uh, less solar power, no more blue skies, ozone depletion, drought in Africa and Asia, rapid warming if stopped and cannot... These, these rather, are rather contradictory. Rapid warming if stopped. Can't stop the effects quickly. I think that one's a little bit odd. But uh, I will we'll come on to that in this one. Here, we, we've run a bunch of different climate models. Uh, and we've, the objective here is, was to essentially set the temperature from uh, uh, these, these kind of scenarios, which are business as usual, or four point, RCP 4.5, and we've managed to get the temperature in most of these models to basically be no temperature increase. The problem is if you stop. Now, there's not many uh, technologies that, that, can, that can keep going, or institutions, if you like, that keep going uh, for, for centuries, like you might need if, if you're looking at something, solar radiation management. And if you stop, all of your climate change happens in about a decade. Now, that is absolutely impossible for ecosystems to adapt to. They can adapt much more, much more. This is, this is the, um, actually the, the Kelvin per decade uh, plots for, this is, the, this is essentially this one, um, the, the business as usual, or 1% 1 1 CO2 per year. 
This is what happens in, terms if you, in the termination phase, and you can see there's this huge increase in temperature that happens very quickly. So that's a big problem. The other thing is, if you, if you do anything and, and mess around with the planet, planet's energy, this is if we geoengineer inject stratospheric aerosol just into the northern hemisphere or just into the southern hemisphere. And one of the big problems is if you inject it just into the northern hemisphere, you get a massive drying of the Sahel, which is a, a very vulnerable region. If you inject into the southern hemisphere, actually it goes the other way. You can, you can green the, um, the, the Sahara up if you do that. Um, that's a, this is a very robust finding. We know that this is right. Um, but let me just show those precipitation uh, things in, in a bit uh, more detail. This is the non-geoengineered case. This is what happens if you've got in the northern hemisphere, bang, your precipitation rates basically drop through the floor. Um, you don't produce any vegetation and the Sahel, all the people die. Uh, if you do uh, the, the same in the southern hemisphere, wow, you can actually green the Sahel. Um, interesting, but uh, there's a reason why, why you would not do that. I mean, you might say, why, why not green the Sahel and make life a whole lot easier? And the reason is there's a counterbalancing impact from the number of hurricanes that form and hit the US. And those increase by about 40%, Katrina-sized hurricanes. Winners and losers, these are the things that, that you've got to be careful of. Um, cloud brightening, yeah, this is a, this is a fantastic looking ship. Um, which is maybe why it got, got so much attention, but what's, what's happening here is these Fletner rotors are blasting uh, sea salt out uh, into, into marine clouds and hopefully brightening them. You can see that these kind of things do happen in reality. These are ship tracks from this area of the Pacific. Each one of these uh, uh, brighter patches of cloud is formed from the, the smokestack, which is emitting sulfur dioxide and aerosol particles into the cloud and more reflection uh, and these smaller cloud droplets uh, in the cloud uh, reflect more sunlight back out to space. However, there are some problems with these kind of technologies. This is just showing uh, some simulations where we've uh, basically got a business as usual. We've cooled the planet using, using uh, by brightening the clouds. Then we've, then we've let it go and there's your big uh, uh, increase in temperature. This is the, the, uh, the temperature change that you sort of, you get when we've basically attacked clouds in these three stratocumulus regions, which is, are where the clouds are most sensitive. These are the areas where if you wanted to uh, brighten the, the, the planet, this, these are the areas that you, you might look at. Um, the problem is, when we did the, these experiments, and it actually was, was this area in particular, the Amazon rainfall drops through the floor. And that's because of this teleconnections. It's, it's a complex circulation in the atmosphere, the Walker circulation, that leads to uh, a far less um, circulation in this particular direction. And that, if you, if you end up drying the, 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 the um, Amazon, this is actually much, um, a much bigger uh, drying effect than, than those that have been seen uh, in nature. Yeah, and Amazon does die back. So you have to be very, very aware of the teleconnection issues. You do something somewhere in the atmosphere, you'll get a response somewhere else. Okay, it's not local forcing, local response. There are teleconnection issues that you must take into account on any geoengineering or any, any climate repair strategy. So these are the take home messages I hope I've got it through to you that, that global warming is serious. If I haven't, I've not been doing my job. And myself and Mr. David haven't. Um, I think that the increase in, of the, the Arctic of around 20 degrees is something that, you know, for, for four degree uh, global mean temperature change, that's what you'll get in the Arctic. All the climate models do that. Um, to, to avoid exceeding one and a half degrees uh, Paris COP target, we need to be at zero emissions by 2020. That's pretty tricky. Um, solar radiation management is a form of climate repair that aims to increase the albedo of the planet, make it more reflective. If used injudiciously, injudici it has the potential cr to create problems with flooding, drought, hurricanes, and the termination effect. This is not a, a simple panacea. 
if used judiciously, it may be what I, I would consider our last gap, gasp effort to reduce global warming. More research is definitely needed, but I would reiterate what Sir David said, we must reduce our reliance on fossil fuels as soon as possible, as I can't see any simple cost-effective solution. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you.